So welcome to Amateur Radio Brief Introduction by our member SOX. Uh, this is a UAS presentation, Allocated Space. We are a 501c3 nonprofit located in Severn, Maryland. Um, our entire uh, shop, our what shop, laser cutter, 3D printers is all donated from the community, all run by the community, all volunteer run. All of our events are free to the public. Uh, there is no event registration required, um, no prerequisites. Uh, we're, we, we host events for all ages and our shop is open to all ages, so long as you promise not to break our stuff. Um, connect with us on Meetup, Twitter, Facebook, um, Slack, Discord, all the things. Uh, with that, I'll give it over to our present presenter, Sox. Well, hey, thank you, Jelly. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I get excited about ham radio, and it occurred to me, we have a ham radio night at, at, on an allocated space once a month, and we typically um, just... In the, especially since COVID, we've been doing them virtually and just kind of talking about, you know, trends in ham, things that are working for us, things that aren't. And um, it occurred to me that we don't, haven't in the past really reached out to people who aren't hams and maybe try to spurn some interest or answer some questions. I mean, maybe, maybe you don't, you're not even interested, but you're just curious about what it is or why someone would be a ham. Um, or maybe you are interested and you want to know more about how would you go about doing that. And so, uh, this is not a class for how to, uh, what the answers are for one of the, the different licenses and stuff. I just sort of a broad overview. And like this introduction, this intro, this start screen here um, indicates, um, I kind of want to focus on the why and the how. Um, but anyway, let's just roll right into it. I um, have, uh, like like Jay was saying, we are unallocated space. Uh, it's a pretty cool group, but he already did the intro. That's awesome. Um, my name is Dave uh, over here on the right side. Who, who That's who we are. Uh, who am I? I'm, I'm Dave and I have a ham radio call sign of KC3JKM. At the space, we sometimes pick edgy hacker names. Um, and it's, I think it's fun. It's for a reason because you know, especially if you go to conventions or in the InfoSec community, you're going to meet a hundred Ben's and a hundred Dave's. And so having a, that's why we have the, um, the edgy hacker names. I think it's, um, it's not immature. I assure you, um, I'm a general class ham. And so there are three different classes which we'll talk about. And um, that's the middle one. So what that should mean is that I'm not a, a total expert. I've only been a ham for uh, coming up on five years, um, but I'm, I'm passionate about it. And so um, I'll try to answer all your questions, but if you'd want, if you like to play Stump the Chump, which I would thoroughly in, invite, um, I might not be able to answer them, um, but, um, I hope that what I lack in not being the, the, the tippy top tier, which is called extra, um, I make up for in passion. Um, I like things that the space does. We tend to kind of focus on information security, um, but also, um, so that's kind of a nerdy, a nerdy thing to do. And ham is generally considered kind of a nerdy thing, um, but I enjoy other things such as beagles and gardening. Um, I feel like it's obligatory to have a who am I, even though I don't like talking about myself. Um, so starting with the who, what, where, when, why, the who, um, first of all, I'd like to start off with the, the term amateur radio. I'll kind of use it interchangeably with ham radio. Um, the two things, it, ham is just a term that's sort of, uh, it means the same thing, but officially it's called amateur radio. Uh, here in the United States, the FCC uh, is the controlling body. It is, uh, you do have to get, like register with uh, the FCC and, and, and the government and everything. And the FCC mandates certain rules. Uh, it's been around for years, for for uh, actually centuries, technically. Uh, it was officially, the, the history, I don't want to get into too much, but um, it's kind of interesting. Like in in the early 1900s, like, it was the Wild West. Like, you know, cars were developing, but we didn't have the Federal Highway Administration. Um, there was no roads. There was no licensing for drivers. You could have 10-year-olds or dogs driving cars. Um, and the same was true with radio. There was, um, that was radios were just a new invention and there was absolutely no regulation at all. So in 1912, the, the federal government uh, passed the national radio act, which established the, the amateur class. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that third bullet it talks about the ARRL or the American radio relay league. When I first got into it, I was sort of confused about, okay, what is their role? Where is, where is the FCC and the ARRL? Um, where does, where's the separation there? And then I later learned the bottom line is that it's, pretty much the singular lobbyist group. And so um, as we'll soon see, there's uh, the ham or amateur radio operators. We get little slices of radio spectrum. Um, and that's the one group that goes to Congress and says, hey, you want to try to take this band away from us? But no, we need it. And here's why. Or, 
hey, we want more spectrum over here. Um, that, that's why. It, it, and I think it's important to keep that in mind because if you do choose to get licensed, you'll eventually get solicitation from them to join. And they have like an annual fee that you have to pay. And they send you a magazine, which is nice. But the magazine, um, in my opinion, there are other better magazines out there. So the only reason I'm focusing so much on that is for me, when I first got licensed, it was a little bit confusing um, as to where the FCC stopped and where the ARRL started. Um, talking about the what, like I mentioned, there are three different classes. Um, I don't want to dwell on this too much here now because I'll talk about it more in the how portion. But essentially, there's technician, the first or entry level class, and uh, you only get access to a couple of different slices of, of bandwidth. Um, general is what I am, and uh, it's sort of the, the medium if you want to break it down to like easy, medium, hard. Um, and you, that allows you to get on high frequency. And the reason why they do that is, I think in general, is that high frequency in certain conditions and certain um, certain free, uh, bands, it has the ability to, to go off, you know, away from your radio, bounce off the sky, then bounce off the ground, then bounce off the sky. They call that sky wave. And so you can talk around the world with, on HF and you can't do that on VHF and UHF. And so I think that's why they have, it'd be really easy to get into and get a technician's license, but then um, they want you to do a little bit more homework and just be able to be a little bit more proficient um, to, be, to be able to get on HF. Um, you may notice a little asterisk there by technician. And the reason for that is that you can actually operate on um, HF as a technician, but they, it's just a little teaser sliver. And we'll talk about that more um, a little bit later. Um, I'm totally, um, I, I totally do have an assistant and I'm not trying to run two computers at once here, but in case, in, in case you can't see it very well, or you just like to see it um, for yourself, I put a link to that um, band, they, they call it a band plan to just to make sure that, you know, you're operating within what's legal. And then you're also transmitting on in a certain mode. It's like, for example, if you know Morse code, they want to keep you away from people who are booming with their voices or um, digital modes are very uh, popular right now too. So they like to kind of either keep those separate or just keep them um, organized, right? So when you're a technician, you can operate on certain HF bands um, and talk around the world, but you have to do it for the most part with Morse. Um, but again, I don't want to dwell here too much. Let's keep it moving. Uh, we'll talk about it more later when, when it comes to the how. Um, I threw this in here just because this is, has nothing to do with amateur radio. Well, it does, but it, it's a, amateur radio is a very small portion. So this is the every every government, every sovereign nation. They look at electromagnetic radiation or the you know radio, and they 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 slice it up and they say we're going to use this for TV. We're going to use this for FM radio in your car. We're going to use this for, we're going to sell this, this big portion of the band to uh, commercial cellular networks so they can um, operate on that. And so um, that's just called like a frequency allocation table or um, a larger band plan for the entire RF spectrum. And so I just wanted to kind of compare to, you know, we get little, as, as hams, we get little slivers of the um, RF spectrum, but those little slivers are in a very crowded area already. And so I don't know if I, I, I like this, this chart just because it's, um, it's really, it's, it's enormous. Um, and so I'll link to that as well, just in case you're curious. Um, oftentimes when it's printed, it's like on a huge poster board, there's so much information there. But the only reason I put it in the presentation is to demonstrate that we have little slivers here and there amongst a bunch of other stuff going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the last slide and this one says that frequency is logarithmic. I um, recently had to like pound that into my head because I always thought it was exponential. I assume there are some folks here from the Maryland STEM Festival. Um, and so I just, um, I wanted to sh demonstrate that uh, essentially what that means is that this very, this, the, this stands for very low frequency. It's extremely low frequency. It's barely in the radio spectrum. Um, three kilohertz to 30 kilohertz is not very much bandwidth at all. Even though this picture makes it look like it's the same as over here, the extremely high frequency where 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz, that's a huge, enormously more amount of bandwidth than um, VLF. And so I'll go back a slide and you'll notice that there are seven colors here. Uh, let me do my map. Oh, shoot, there are five, there's uh, eight. But the, um, the government, at least our government in the US, um, breaks them down in the same way. Um, so when I say stuff like, oh yeah, let's talk on HF, you'll notice here in the middle, 
there is nothing for HF. That's because it's, it's generally used for um, things that people aren't used to operating on. Um, another big thing that's in HF are uh, radars, uh, because you can use a radar that bounces off, off the ground and atmosphere to look over the horizon. Um, but then we have just little small slivers of it in there. Um, I, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but um, I, I, I just wanted to show that, you know, the whole thing of we get, as hams, we get slivers of a big picture, and then the big picture is then uh, divided into different ways of talking about it. Um, in like a more in-depth class, they'd go through and talk to you about which, you know, what these different frequencies mean and, and how much bandwidth that is and, and what the different characteristics are of each band. But I don't want to get too deep into the weeds. I want to try to talk more about the, the why and the how. Um, so we'll skip where for now, because I want to talk about Maryland specific resources. Um, and so we'll get into the why. Um, these are just the reasons that I came up with. And uh, there are probably a whole bunch more, but th these cover a good, a good portion of what, um, what you, you know, why some people, some, some people might want to get into ham radio. Um, so, and also I try to, it doesn't line up perfectly, but I tried to kind of break it down into the core tenets of unallocated space of teach, learn, build, but, um, let's go through one by one. So for learning, um, I'm, I just personally, I find it fascinating to, to how the atmosphere works with radio waves. Um, I mentioned earlier that HF can bounce off the atmosphere, then the ground, then the atmosphere, then the ground. That's true, but we, you know, with a bunch of different caveats and when that happens and why and how, um, because the, ion, the, the atmosphere, uh, at least the portion that we're concerned about is the ionosphere, not the stratosphere. Uh, I, that's the only other one I know. But um, there are different layers to the ionosphere. And so in certain frequencies, um, certain frequencies will um, bounce off different layers. And then also you'll see in this picture that there's the sun is, is depicted in this little graphic for a reason, because the sun, the, the, the radiation that comes from the sun also affects the ionosphere. So some bands work better at night. And um, well, some bands, some conditions, it, it pretty much only works at night. If you want to do that sky wave, bounce off the atmosphere and ground, talk around the world in certain, uh, for certain bands, like you pretty much, you have to do it at night. Otherwise the, the sun will, um, it won't ionize the, the portion that we need, I think is my understanding. Again, that's me being a general, uh, not knowing exactly how that works, but the point, I, I just like learning about the atmosphere and how that works. So I've, I've had fun with that. I, I imagine some of y'all might be interested. Um, what that sort of alludes to is solar weather. Um, this graphic here is sort of in the top middle is a just a, a little pane that's always available on a, web, a popular website called QRZ, or uh, most people call it QRZ. Um, which is a way to look up folks. They just cover ham news. It's sort of like, I wouldn't call it the Google of ham radio. I'd call it like, if you remember, if anyone remembers the old slash shot, it's just a, a very popular um, place to go for current ham trends. And they're always tracking solar weather, which I didn't even know was a thing, honestly. Um, speaking of it, I've learned, for example, that uh, roughly every 11 or 12 years, um, the sun has its own like seasons, if you will, or at least um, it has a patterns in which it radiates to us. And so there uh, are uh, pre somewhat predictable cycles and we're rolling in right now. If you want to be a ham rolling into it, we're about to get into a very active good cycle. Uh, I got licensed about five years ago and um, I would eagerly seek out other hams to um, talk to Elmer's as I'll talk about later. Um, and like, Oh yeah. Um, well, we're glad you got licensed, but we're sort of in the bottom of a solar cycle right now. So don't expect too much on HF, whatever. Um, the point is learning about solar weather. I didn't think that I would, even need to know about that before I became a ham. Um, RF theory, oops, wrong button. Um, RF theory is real um, interesting to me as well. This graphic on the top right is a 3D representation of a three element um, Yagi, which is a, a pretty much a directional antenna. These, these three gray bars represent the three elements. Um, and so this neat looking blob, I guess for lack of a better term, um, shows the the radiation pattern and so that's a pretty basic one um it's not the most basic like uh there's there's one where it's pretty much just a piece of wire or two pieces of wire with a um a feed line in the middle they call it those are excuse me um a little bit more uh simple than this but then they make super complex antennas and i i'm not an engineer like a an antenna engineer but um i find it fascinating uh like for example you can buy you can buy um rf 
tape measures. It looks just like a tape measure you would buy from Lowe's or Home Depot, but it measures um, frequency wavelength instead if you want to make your own. Because the bottom line is that you can go online and find places that will sell you a piece of wire for $200, or you can find a piece of wire, measure it precisely, cut it yourself for a handful of dollars, and you have an incredibly good antenna if you, um, you're good with the RF theory. Um, real briefly earlier, I mentioned uh, digital modes. So think of like Morse as the original digital mode. Um, but it's since then, and for lo uh, long since then, um, they've come up with different innovative ways. And now, uh, you know, just in the last 20 years that computers have become not only more available, but more suitable and, and, and usable to, um, to not only control the radio, but then run the software and make the software not a, a pain in the butt to use. Um, there's just been an explosion in different types of digital modes. Uh, I was hoping to like get neat, uh, like, I don't know, sound files so that you could hear the difference between an Olivia signal or a PSK31. You know, that could be a who's a what's it and whatchamacallit for all you all you care if, if um, if you're not into like the digital ham radio modes. But the point is they, they sound kind of cool. And then they're just learning how to analyze the signal, how to decode it and make it an actual communication as opposed to some neat beeps and squeaks. Um, I think it's kind of fun. There's the, the software behind that is, um, it's to me, it's one of those things, maybe it's because I'm bad at using computers, but just when you get it working, it's that feels like a sense of accomplishment. So I've enjoyed that aspect. Um, this picture in the bottom middle uh, is a kind of a bad one. I just was looking for um, people working radios outside. And if you look closely, you can see that there are indeed trees. <laughs> so this guy is outside, or a guy or gal is outside. Um, but when you think about it, like operating sensitive radio equipment and, and their, um, all their associated you know, support equipment and their power and stuff outside in the field, um, it takes a lot of preparation, planning, um, a lot of people really go bonkers for it. As a matter of fact, uh, I would dare say that of the different events that happen every year, um, either in the United States or worldwide, one of the biggest ones is called field day. It's usually in the summer and, um, well, it's always in the summer. They have a winter field day as well, but, um, where everybody, the, the idea is to just get everybody outside and operate from not inside your house in the comfort of glorious air conditioning. Um, and so I, I like the idea of, not necessarily doing that because it's often hot and buggy, but the preparation, the thought, and the um, just the thinking that goes into the to leading up to it. I, I, I've enjoyed that myself personally. And then the last thing, electrical engineering, um, you have to learn some basic stuff, at least to get general. So there's a certain port, uh, just a very, very small amount. I don't even know if it's enough to call it electrical engineering, but um, learning how to read a wiring diagram, I, I've found has been a rewarding uh, reason to get into ham radio. Um, community. So these are all, well, not all of them, but um, the hams are generally very friendly people. Uh, that almost every single one I've met, if, if I was shirtless, they would give me the, the shirt off their back. Not sure why I'd be walking around shirtless asking hams for their shirt, but there's just that type of person. Um, and so, and they're just incredibly friendly. They're always very helpful. I remember when I was first getting an InfoSec uh, years and years ago, I found the InfoSec community to be very off-putting um, I would, I would finally manage to get Linux installed on the computer and then nothing would work. And I'd go ask somebody who was really good with Linux and they would immediately tell me without even wanting to hear my question to just read the friendly manual, um, kind of off-putting. It was very like, not secretive, but, um, exclusive club. It seemed like at least in the like early and mid nineties, um, ham radio is the opposite of that. All the, the, the most people, most hams will, they're, they're, they're eager to, um, to share their knowledge and, and, and mentor someone. I'm kind of getting into the next slide here. But the point is that when you do that, you're, you're getting out in the community, you're meeting people, you're learning um, where there's different cool ham shacks and stuff. Um, and so uh, I'm sorry, I got off track there for a minute because I'm going out of order on my, um, on my slide here. Um, interestingly, so the, for, for those that are um, from the, coming from the space, today is the, the first day of, um, the Maryland STEM Festival. And the theme for this year is health and wellness. So that's why this health and wellness thing is, is here. And um, really, I think there's a tangible, measurable way to, to, to 
to, uh, to measure at least how the Central Maryland ham community is helping with that. Because of this first graphic up here in the top left is the Prince George's County, uh, they call it ARIES for Amateur Radio Emergency Service. Uh, a couple of friends of mine are very active in this and every month they run like an emergency network. Um, they, they, they practice transmitting emergency messages from one hospital to another. Um, and so if that's not helping your community with health and wellness, I don't know what, what is. Um, for, uh, from afar, I just want to include this because I remember this story I thought was pretty neat. When uh, Hurricane Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico, it was it was devastating. That the island was not prepared for it, which surprised me because they're in the Caribbean. But I guess one the uh, communication was a critical um, critical need that they had for recovery, and so uh, a whole bunch of hams um, went there and. Um, tried to help and they were using innovative digital modes. One of the digital modes uh, that I haven't mentioned is called WinLink and it allows you to send email um, over ham radio. And it's, it's, it's kind of slow, uh, but it, you can go you know, from just HF radio to another HF radio or to an HF radio to the actual internet because they'll have nodes that are connected to both. And then you can you know, email someone at Gmail or you know, hospital.org. Um, and so, or the vice versa, you can send email to a ham that's out in the field. And so that was really critical because what they were doing is they were going out to these remote areas, like outside of San Juan, sort of um, more rural areas of Puerto Rico and sending just text message, you know, just text emails, nothing more. Cause again, it's kind of slow, but um, lists of critical medicine that if they didn't send that, if that information wasn't known, like, Hey, you need, we need this much, you know, I don't know, medicine A and this much medicine B, People could, I mean, they, they, they could have died, you know? So in a sense, the, at least when that happened, hams actually really did like save lives. Um, I'm sorry, let me get Sox's assistant here to po post links. That link is to the PG County Aries net. Whoops. Um, this is a pretty interesting, and, and there's a bunch of articles about, about that um, ham support to Hurricane Maria, but that one's a little bit more detailed. Uh, so I like that one. Um, I put continue legacies on there just because PG County Aries net that's been around since I think, uh, like the mid seventies. Um, oh, I didn't talk about the Laurel club. I forget how I, I failed to mention them. Uh, I'm, I personally live in college park, but I'm just sort of a central Maryland guy. If we have people from, you know, Southern Maryland or Western Maryland, um, this, this might not be as, as helpful, but anyway, the Laurel amateur radio club, they've been around since 1984, um, I'm a big, big fan of the NASA Goddard, which is located in Greenbelt. Um, they have a club station and they've been around for, for decades. Um, and it's a really cool club station. I'll come back to them later. Uh, and then the last bullet here is competing. Um, the, the, this image on the bottom is a, is what they, we call a waterfall where it shows frequency activity, uh, over time. So it's like a temporal look at how the radio spectrum looks for any given swath of bandwidth. So, you know, earlier I was saying, oh, yes, hams get a little sliver of bandwidth here or a sliver of bandwidth there. I don't know. It's too hard to see in this picture. But let's just say this is looking at the entire sliver of the bandwidth that hams get. Um, you can see there's a lot of activity on there. It pro it's probably what they call a contest where people will try to just make as many contacts as possible. The contacts are very brief. You don't talk about what you had for lunch or um, how the weather is doing. You just make the contact, log it and move on. Um, and at least locally in the community, there are many, many clubs where what it comes down to is a shortage of people willing to do it because sometimes they're grueling. I mentioned field day earlier. That's 24 hours. So most stations that try to actually compete and, and take it seriously, they'll have like stacks of people. Um, <laughs> they'll have like stacks of people uh, ready to go so that they have like shifts. Um, and it's just it's a way to help the local community. So I thought I'd throw that in there. Also, well, let's admit it. Waterfalls, they look cool. Um, so this is the last thing for why. I know I kind of blew through that quickly, even though I said it was supposed to be the main thrust of this uh, presentation, but I don't know. Um, we, we got some more to go. I, for teaching, I, I've, in a different life, I had some, I was an instructor and it, instructing can be kind of annoying because if you do it in a professional way, because they're just pushing groups of people through and you're, you're, it's always the same material and you always have the same numbers. A couple people get it, a couple people don't, you move on. But every once in a while, uh, I found it to be a very rewarding job when someone would, you, you chose somebody a concept or a, an operation, like a, um, 
technical thing. And the look on someone's face when they suddenly they, they get it um, in that in that realization that they understand and something clicked, um, I've always found very rewarding. And believe me, um, there are lots of there's a, no shortage of, of new hams that need uh, mentoring um, or just guidance or maybe free equipment, which happens a lot, um, which I'll circle back to. Whenever I say that, that means um, being an Elmer or sometimes you'll, uh, you'll hear it referred to as Elmering. And so if you ever taught somebody something and, and enjoyed and you got a little sense satisfaction out of them getting it, then there's no shortage of um, uh, capacity for you to uh, get, get that out of, out of ham radio. Um, I like this picture in the top left because these are pretty young, young sprouts here. Um, that's definitely a thing. I remember when I first got licensed, when I first got tech, there was um, a couple of kids waiting in the hall outside of the testing room. And I thought they were just waiting for it to open because I was a little early. They had already tested. And so one of them has a, a sequential call sign with me. And they were at the time they were 10 and seven. And so I've heard, I've kept in touch with their parents and them through local repeaters. And um, it's funny because you'll hear the then 10 year old teach his, his younger brother, something like on air, or he'll tell a story about how they tried something else out. So it, it, you know, the general term of Elmer, I think um, came about because Elmer is kind of an antiquated name. You don't meet a lot of new, you know, taught newborn Elmers. It's um, and uh, let's be honest, there are a lot of old hams. And so I think that's kind of why they landed on Elmer. Um, Cause it's oftentimes a very old person teaching a new ham, but it doesn't have to be. And it doesn't have to like the, it doesn't have to be older to younger either. Um, as an example, Jelly, our president of UAS, um, taught me how to fix my DMR uh, hotspot, which is a, a way to. It's called. It stands for digital mobile radio, and it's a way to uh, connect uh, a radio that you have to the internet, so then you can talk to other DMR um, uh, nodes, I believe is the term. But it's just a way to do um, uh, HF through the internet. And I just, I bought the equipment and I just could not for the life of me get it working, but um, I'm kind of dating myself here, but I'll, I'll just, let's just put it this way. I'm a little bit older than Jelly, but he, he was, um, you know, super eager to help, help me and get, get working. And I, I would imagine that um, once you did and you fixed it and I was just thrilled and I was pumped, um, maybe that was fun for him. Um, I stuck emergency preparedness in this uh, thing for the why, the teaching, because um, uh, it's funny, I was today, I was at work, I was telling a guy next to me, I'm like, oh yeah, tonight I'm giving a presentation about ham radio. He's like, ham radio, what are you, uh, are you like one of those weirdo doomsday preppers? I'm like, no, no. But the, the truth is that there are a lot of people that get into it solely for that. Um, and I, I get it. Um, you know, if, if we were to have a catastrophic loss of like power or the cell phone network and the internet goes down, ham radio is always going to work because it's just RF energy going over the air. There's no need for, you know, a transformer on the pole outside or um, a router at your, um, I don't know, um, Verizon office up the street or something. So it is, I think, a valid way if you're into doomsday prepping. Um, uh, but I didn't want to like kind of focus on that. Uh, for whatever reason, not important. But the reason I put it here is because if that were to happen, if you are a doomsday prepper and you want to like um, rely on ham radio in a situation like that, what that means, the, the a couple, no, it was about, a, I guess about a little over a year ago, I was giving a similar presentation to my um, army reserve unit. Um, this was right when COVID was really getting bad. And it was like, people were seriously starting to wonder like, are, are we going to have martial law? Like what would happen? And so my, um, at the time I was in the army reserves and they asked me to give a presentation about it. And my main focus was that yes, ham radio is a viable alternative, but when that happens, like if, when the power grid goes out, that is not the time to say, Oh, um, did I charge my, did I charge the radio? Do I, did I program it? Is it, you know, what do I program it to? Where are the repeaters around here? What is the calling frequency if there aren't any repeaters? Um, and then also, so the one that you I guess that should go on the previous slide. You, you have to learn about what you would do, um, in that situation, but it goes here because, uh, assuming you have some sort of family, or if, even if you live alone, if you have other family, you want to contact, um, you have to teach them, uh, what the limitations are and how to, um, how to do it. And so like the situation I use is, oh yeah, I have, uh, I live in central Maryland, but, uh, you know, Sergeant so-and-so lives down in, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. So what, what frequencies or bands or um, stuff would he need to get licenses on and get equipment for, for us to be able to communicate in a situation like that? Or, you know, my family, my extended family is all from the Midwest. And so then, okay, HF is probably in, in play. Do my, uh, you know, parents and siblings and stuff, do they have HF radios? Or if they, if they're willing to get them, 
can I teach them to, to do it? Um, so that's why I put emergency preparedness uh, on here. Really, it's just a way to bring up um, like disaster preparedness. Um, but it's disaster preparedness means nothing if people that you're t communicating with aren't aren't trained. So I believe that should go in teaching. And it's fun to prep for, I guess. I'm not a doomsday prepper, by the way. The little bullet for non-HAM RF, uh, essentially, when you learn all that stuff in the uh, previous slide or uh, whatever, uh, it'll apply to other things. And so, for example, we'll talk uh, towards the end about how much does this actually cost. And one of the great things is that you can buy what they call a software-defined receiver for like 20 bucks. It looks like a thumb drive or something that you just plug in and um, it because it offloads most of the work of the radio to the computer. And they're super cheap now. They didn't used to be. Um, but you like a cool project for that is like um, using those to receive uh, NOAA weather weather NOAA um, weather satellite communications. So you can get real time imagery from the satellite as it passes overhead without the need for the internet or you know anything. I think really I don't know if if why you would need to do that if you have the internet. And if you were in a disaster preparedness situation, well, who knows? Maybe that would be good to know if whether or not a storm is coming. Uh, the picture here uh, is about a story I read where some guy was using a software-defined radio that had the ability to transmit, which are it's quite a bit more ex expensive than the, the cheapo one I mentioned earlier. And he was just playing with um, faking GPS signals, which is not ham radio, but still he was learning. He was having fun. I'm, I'm sure he was, well, I would be, I would be willing to bet he was a ham radio guy who had got started with that. And he was um, making fake GPS signals. But the thing is GPS receivers are designed to hear a v extremely faint signal. And as a matter of fact, let me go back a couple of things. Uh, one thing here and make this bigger. Can I zoom up? Oh, I can't. Well, if you squint, you'll just have to bear with me. This green sort of line on the, on the bottom portion of this image, that's what we call the noise floor, where all the ambient RF energy in the area makes sort of a floor of the aggregate RF energy. And so GPS is actually designed to operate below that. So this guy, he was, I think he was in the south eastern Italian coast. He was just playing around thinking that nothing would really, uh, he wouldn't get in any trouble or couldn't cause any harm. But because GPS is so incredibly sensitive, um, he, he was able to, he accidentally uh, transmitted some GPS signals that steered a, this huge ocean liner off course. It wasn't the Costa Concordia one where it tipped over, but it was, you know, it was enough that it caused a big incident and he did some serious jail time. Don't do that, by the way. I actually, I've at one time, the NASA Goddard Club was trying to put together like sort of an open house day where they try to spurn interest in ham radio. And um, they were asking people to put together um, like demonstrations, you know, so one guy could demonstrate um, HF, one gal could do, demonstrate um, talking on satellites or something. And so I came up with the idea of GPS spoofing. And so I wanted to do it properly. I emailed the um, FCC public relations team and the NASA Goddard um, like center, uh, emergency operations center. And um, I didn't get a response. It's kind of weird. And so I told the club about it and they're like, you did what? You want to do what? So don't ever uh, fake GPS signals. But I just thought it was an interesting way of, of taking ham knowledge and applying it to something else that's cool. Uh, and the last bullet, fake it. Uh, is alludes to the idea of putting it on your resume or using it as a credential. And I've heard people talk in the for and against this. I definitely am in the for category. I think that uh, showing, putting, if if you're in, if you're seeking any sort of technical job, it doesn't have to be related to RF at all. But it shows, it, to me, it shows a potential employer that you're willing to, um, you're you're willing to be interested in a technical hobby. Um, you're willing to comply with the rules and register yourself with the government. So probably not a terrorist. Um, I think it goes really good on on resumes, uh, and I say that having been part of the hiring process um, for my day job, and also um, also I don't I don't know if I doubt there's any military in here, but back when I was in the military, uh, some folks in in certain fields they would put that on their annual evaluations, which was a uh, important to them. Point is, I think it looks good. Uh, since this is the last Y slide, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I put a tiny little bullet down here that says preserve a dying hobby. And unfortunately, this is where I have to put in the why wouldn't someone um, want to get into it? Because the God's honest the truth is that ever since the internet became pretty much ubiquitous, um, ham clubs and, and just numbers in general have been sort of dwindling and stagnant. Um, because, I mean, let's be real. I have a buddy who's a ham and he goes home to, uh, to Georgia, I want to say, 
every you know a couple times a year and he has a friend there who's a ham and he every time he's like hey bring your radio we'll um we'll, we'll coordinate pick up at the airport through that and he's just like why would i do that i have a phone and, and i get the sentiment but you, how many people learn how phones actually work or you know learn about solar weather but the bottom line is that it, it, the, the numbers are dwindling and so that's a, a good reason why i think but while we're in this like this sort of tone uh, i thought i should bring up some other I wouldn't say negative aspects of ham radio, but some limitations that are that can be frustrating. Um, one, the, and to me, this is the main one, is that you're not allowed to use encryption of any sort or encoding of any sort. There are there are weird exceptions. So, like if you're controlling a spacecraft, you can use encoding, um, which can be done. They have a there's a system or not a system, but just sort of a a category of of radio sport called OSCAR, which stands for Orbiting Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. And there are tons of satellites. Usually it's like a little add-on to a satellite that does something else. But you, um, there are lots of different ham satellites in space. And so if you're, if you're in a position to control one of those, you can use encoding. And then also the way the regulation is, is uh, phrased, there's this curious thing where it says, if, if you're using encrypt, you can't use encryption at all unless you make the key public. Oh, which begs the question, well, what does public mean? If I put it on my door um, and I'm only transmitting on VHF in, in the city, does that count? What if you put it on a website that's like not advertised, but it is publicly accessible? Um, there's some, uh, in my opinion, gray area there. But in general, you're going to draw some, you're going to raise some eyebrows if you start transmitting encrypted stuff. Um, so for at least for for infosec people, that can be a big detractor. To me, that's the really the main one, but I, that's probably unique to me. And then like there are other some some other like kind of strange rules, like you can't transmit music at all. Um, there's like a small exception for if you're if you're transmitting music from within a manned spacecraft and there happens to be music playing in your manned spacecraft. I think they put that in just for the International Space Station, but now we got commercial flights going up to orbit, so maybe that's maybe maybe they had the foresight to put that in for the um, Jeff Bezos's flight and stuff. It beats me. Um, and, and then there's like you can't swear, you can't talk about um, since like the. It highly discourages people from talking about sensitive topics. Essentially, to me, it's like the 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 Thanksgiving rule, where it's like you should really shouldn't talk about religion or um, politics at Thanksgiving. Um, and, but I think that's like a highly discouraged. The point is, there are some the FCC imposes some rules that are quite a big turnoff for some folks. <clears throat> um, that's all about I have for why. I I don't know if I did a good enough job to jump up and down and cheerlead for it, but to me the 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 counterpoint to all those arguments of yeah but I have a phone or yeah but I have a computer that's a pretty good argument but I mean there are other reasons to get into a hobby like you're not most hams don't get into ham because they want to have that be their primary form of communication they get into it because it's fun you can learn a lot there's you know it's not like you're trying to no one's no ham's going to make the argument that oh yes I can replace your phone by sending email over HF that's just it's not feasible but um. That's all about I have for why. So uh, I'll, I'll move it along. I'm, I can see the chat. Um, no questions as far as I can tell. Um, how and where. So I feel like these days there's a presentation isn't a presentation without a meme. And so I guess this is my obligatory meme. Um, but it happens to tie into health and wellness. So that's why I was okay with putting a meme in my presentation because usually I keep, I keep meme free. Um, when COVID happened, this meme was going around a lot between hams. And um, it's true because the thing is, um, free, you can measure a radio wave a couple of different ways, a bunch of different ways, really. But the ones that are most common is to measure its uh, the, the, the frequency on which it transmits, or you would tune a radio to, which in this case is 144 megahertz. Or um, if you were to like visualize that, ray, that wave, that in the, the one full wavelength as depicted on the thing here is roughly two meters. And so just quick, funny story. I sent this to my buddy or a buddy um, who's like kind of a stickler. He's like, he didn't even laugh. He didn't lull. It wasn't funny to him. Uh, he immediately says that doesn't seem right. So he did the math. And um, since we have the Maryland STEM Fest folks here, this is the equation in question. And he was right. It's I evidently it's like one, one forty eight point nine or one forty nine point nine. I forget, but, I just I found it funny because like he's such a his sense of humor was so dry. He like, oh hey hold on let's check, double check that meme. Uh, who fact checks a ham radio meme? But anyway I'm getting off topic here. Uh, so 
the, the point of it is safety first. So we'll talk about licensing and how you can do that in COVID, even though I feel like things are starting to return to normal. Uh, for the most part, count on doing it online, which is kind of frustrating because half the fun of getting licensed and getting into the ham community is going there and seeing that they always have some sort of cool whiz bang, you know, radio beeping and stuff or an, an antenna petting zoo. Um, and then there's people there that you can meet and learn, get to learn the community, know the community a little bit better. Can't, it's harder to do that online, but anyway, safety first. <clears throat> This sequential licensing thing here means, that, and this is just my opinion, I know a lot of people that like to skip to the very end because essentially, um, like I said, tech is the most restrictive, then general allows you much, much more, and then extra allows you a little bit extra, <clears throat> excuse me. And so if you're paying to, to test, which sometimes you have to pay and sometimes you don't, and I'll talk about that later, um, if you were to go in order, then you would be paying for three licensing, um, three exam licenses, it's not much. I mean, places that charge for it, it's option. The FCC doesn't require to charge and they don't, they don't, some places will do it for free and others won't. And so if you can find a place to do it for free, I recommend doing it in order because to me, it's like tech is sort of like a learner's permit where you have to be with somebody who, you know, who has a car or some, like an adult or something when you're 14. Um, and then general is like, okay, you're, uh, you're a, you can have your a full car li driver's license. And then extra is sort of like, okay, now I can teach driver's ed or something. And so to me, I, I like the idea of doing it sequentially. However, it's not required. I just put it in there because it's purely my opinion. Uh, a lot of people, they like to go test once and go straight to extra. Um, and then they have bragging rights, which I think that's valid bragging rights, but I recommend sequential, whatever, to each their own. Um, we kind of went through this earlier. I'll talk, talk a little bit more about it now. Um, if you can't see, if the image on screen isn't clear enough to read the text and stuff, um, I, I did link to it earlier, but essentially what we're looking for here is if you, if you test for tech first, then anything that has a T, uh, here indicates that you can transmit on that. So here's an example, like I said earlier, on 40 meters, where on 40 meters, there's a T here, but it's this little squiggly line means that you can only transmit Morse code. You can't use, um, digital modes in red or uh, like voice modes in green. And they do that to encourage people to learn voice, I think is, is mo most people's theory. But um, that's pretty much how to read this chart. You can see, again, I'm not sure how easy it is to see with the variation of people's screens, but the bottom line is that, or the, not the bottom line, the, the, the broad strokes are that um, when you get technician, you, you can get everything from six meters or 50 megahertz and higher. When I say higher, I mean frequency, um, shorter wavelength, but I don't want to get too technical here. Uh, these numbers here are how, uh, how many, the numbers on the right are how many questions there are in the test. And then the numbers on the left are how many questions you need to get correct in order to, uh, in order to uh, pass. And so as you can see, it's not terribly, I mean, there's not a lot of questions and you can miss quite a bit. So the point of this is that it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty, it's not demanding. Um, Quick side story. Well, I thought that for most of my life, I thought that you had to know Morse because for the, the majority of the time that ham radio has been around, there was a requirement to be able to copy Morse. Um, they had a words per minute requirement, and that that uh, that was different depending on what license you, you were going for. And then uh, one day, I, I went to a thing, a presentation about this stuff, and I said, "Oh yeah, they dropped all Morse requirements in 2006." And this is this is like 2015 or something. And I, what they did, I didn't know that. So I got tech like immediately. I didn't use it that much, but that, it's it's very easy to test for, which we'll talk about, I think, next. Um, the bottom line is there are, there's no Morse requirement. If you've heard that, it's, it hasn't been true in a while. And um, the, this is not like you're taking the GRE or, or some very difficult long test or something. So um, everyone likes books. I, uh, well, some people don't like them anymore, but... Books are nice because the you know it's just you can just pick it up and put it down. You don't have to think, oh, where's my phone or is the app installed or something. Um, Ham Study. The reason this is the largest picture in the middle is it's a website um, that is pretty mobile friendly. Uh, the reason I like it is because it's maintained really well. It's it's a well put together website. Something I kind of glossed or I didn't even gloss. Or I didn't bring. I I deliberately didn't bring up earlier is that for a lot of times you'll you'll find like a radio club or. Um, 
yeah, it's usually like a club or a, a thing about a repeater. And you'll find the websites look very old. They're not maintained very well, or they have like an older looking design. Um, a lot of the times they don't use uh, SSL. So it, like at least my, my browser like warns me, hey, this is a dangerous website because it's just regular old HTTP. Um, I've learned that, you know, that's just an artifact of the people who are maintaining them. Like I said, the, the ham uh, radio operator population in general tends to be a little bit older. Um, but I've learned just quick little pro tip. Um, don't offer say, hey, that website looks old. We should update it because I, I, I say that because I've said that to several different groups. I'm like, oh, OK, um, go ahead and redesign it for us. <laughs> so if you um, be prepared for that, for one. And then also, if you want to complain about it to clubs, be prepared to fix it for them. Um, but that's why the, with that in mind, Ham Study is cool because it's, it's got a modern design. It uh, has a mobile version. And the person who runs it is actually very active on Reddit, which I don't know if that's a, a plus or anything. But to me, it just tells me that the, the person who runs the site is um, engaged, which is cool. And it's 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 really well done. Um, people love apps. I, I put just a screenshot for a, a random search of ham study because when I got uh, tech, the the app, the hot the app that was all the hotness at the time was called Ham Boss. And it doesn't seem to exist anymore. So that's unfortunate. But just, you know, do if either in your Google or our, um, you know, Apple store, um, just search for hamster. There's tons of different ones. Just pick one and see if you like it. But again, can't recommend enough hamstudy.org. It's really cool. Um, I like Maryland. Um, there's lots of different clubs. I like if you, Back in my home state, uh, there is nowhere near the amount of d diversity in clubs. Like I said, I'm in central Maryland. I live quite close to the Goddard Amateur Radio Club. Um, I just chose to put an overhead view of their club station because, one, they have a club station. It's very cool. These are three trailers from FEMA that were originally donated to NASA because they were uh, to be used in the Hurricane Katrina relief efforts, but they ended up not being used. And NASA's like, oh, you know, what are we going to do with hurricane relief trailers. So then they gave them to the ham club. So they have three, I mean, they're old now, but I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big club station. They have a bunch of cool equipment. Can't really see it in this picture, but they have some really nice antennas. Um, they're from a technical standpoint, they have a really cool club station. And I don't know how far Beltsville is for everyone else, but um, I'm sorry, green belt, but it's, um, I recommend them a lot. I haven't I honestly messed with or uh, interact with uh, the Laurel Amateur Radio Club very much, but I've heard just outstanding things about them. Um, let me put some links in chat here. Let's see here. And if you want to go to some of these websites, you'll see what I mean about some antiquated looking pages. But anyway, um, the point of this uh, slide here, and I'm getting kind of long, so I'm going to move it along here. Um, uh oh, here's another Google thing. I hope this works. It worked for me when I was putting this list together. Uh, yeah, so those two I just put in, that's for, for Goddard and for the Goddard uh, NASA Club and Laurel. This next one is for the, the Maryland Mobile Ears, which I guess they operate out of Severn. I know them. I've had good experience with them because once a year they do a, a ham festival or ham fest in Odenton, Maryland. Um, and uh, I don't know. I've just, I've had good luck with them. It's a cool group. Um, it's not shameful. It's it's selfish of me to include Hack Hack DC is down on uh, in Columbia Heights in Washington DC, but that's because I live next to the metro. So let's swap that out with a picture of excuse me, how many repeaters there are in in the you know just in the central Maryland area. And you can scroll around. There's there's a you know southern and western Maryland are cut off in that crappy little picture. Uh, so if we happen to have people coming from there, um, let me post a link to that site. If you want to po look around, poke around your neighborhood. Um, again, not. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but if you were to look at my home state, there are not that many dots on the map at all. Um, I'm going to put another link to uh, repeaters, like a list of repeaters, because that site is just the first one I found that put dots on a map, but sort of the gold standard for finding repeaters in your area is a site called the repeaterbook.com or repeaterbook.com. There's no the. Um, the point is that Maryland is cool, right? Uh, there's a lot of resources for us here. I feel I'm actually on orders with my weekend warrior unit, not in Florida at the moment, but I feel very lucky to be based out of there. Uh, and then lastly, let's be real. I got I, I to gotta be biased here. Um, unallocated space also has a station, which is cool. You can kind of see this is, uh, I don't know where I got this image from, but 
Unallocated space is located at that address, kind of here's Baltimore up here in the top right, and DC is just off screen in the bottom left. And um, honestly, we don't we don't operate out of it that much, but you know, this um, like Jelly pointed out, the space is very um, extremely welcoming and open to the public. And like any if like that, we have a project night once a you know once a week, and so. You know, if you're interested at all, it doesn't have to be a ham night. You can just show up. And I'm sure someone, uh, one of the, the keys or um, people opening and closing the space will be like, yeah, sure. You want to check out the ham shack? Let's check it out. Um, so uh, don't count us out. <laughs> and then I think this is one of the last slides I got here. Uh, but essentially, everyone always asks, what does it cost? And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the software defined radio is an extremely easy way to get into it. This was just, an, just a ra uh, random listing for $26 on Amazon, but you can often find them for as cheap as like 15 or something. I think this one might be a little bit more because of the fancy case or because it comes with a little antenna mount and antenna. But for you know less than $30, you can listen to what's on air because well, the problem with these is that you can't transmit with this cheap of an SDR. But you can listen to and receive all sorts of other stuff. You can use these things to like uh, monitor, you know, aircraft communications, either by the, piece, the 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 pilots talking through the aircraft, or they have a thing called ADS-B, where the aircraft like automatically plots or broadcasts its position. I think heading and speed as well. And so you can get software to decode that and just like draw a map of all the planes going around overhead. It's, I mean, it's not super. Um, crazy information. But the interesting thing is that the military is required to transmit on it. So like in the in the DMV area, you can see Air Force One coming and going, even though their radio is silent, or they probably operate on some radio thing that we don't even know about. But their, their ADS-B is active. And so you can see like Air Force One flying around and stuff and military jets from, was it Andrews or whatever. So that's kind of neat. And like I mentioned, the NOAA weather thing, getting weather images from orbiting satellites with those SDRs, you can get into it for a very low cost. Again, Problem is no transmitting. If you want to transmit, this is a very cheap um, handheld radio, or sometimes they call them HTs, which stands for hand, you know handy talkie. Um, and again, the, the Amazon price list of there says twenty five dollars, but you can oftentimes find them for quite a bit cheaper than that. Um, a lot of seasoned hams tend to make fun of them, but I think that's I, I, I disagree with that. They work very well for what you're what you're getting. I have talked all you know. I, up and down in the state of Maryland. I, I think I've got it into Northern Virginia a couple of times on mine. Um, I have several. I bought one because I thought it was neat. And then I got one as a door prize. That's how cheap they are. Um, if you want to step it up a little bit more, if you want to get into HF, that's when things start to get expensive because this is about, this is one of the cheaper HF radios you can get. Um, it's a shui gu, you know, I, I don't want, I don't like it when people just randomly rip on China for no reason, but the people do. And so a shui gu, I don't know. It is a cheaper HF radio, but it works and it, you can talk around the world on it for, you know, 448. The problem with HF is that oftentimes the support equipment and antenna becomes um, as much of a cost or close to as much, you know, that stuff costs a lot too, because you probably need um, a, a fancy antenna and then like clamps and hooks and stuff to hang it because HF antennas are generally in general, it's kind of broad, broadly speaking here, much better if they're high up in the air. Um, and then, Unless uh, most of the time you're going to have to find a way to tune it because um, you, you need to make the antenna be it, the length itself of the physical antenna stays the same, but you electrically tune it to make it so that electrically it's shorter or longer. Um, and so then you got to get one of those and then you got to get, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the fancy cabling going from outside to inside. And then you got to get a pass through to have your cables go through your window without letting the cold, you know, the, the cold air out. Um, so, this this value here of four hundred forty eight dollars for a low end HF is a little bit deceiving to be honest. So prepare yourself for that. Uh, I see Chris asked how hard it is to make your own antenna. Uh, the short answer is it's very easy if you're if you don't expect a lot. If you want, because the thing is, like I, I kind of mentioned, alluded to earlier, you can make an antenna that's resonant or um, it works on on a specific frequency. Um, but it, essentially, an analogy I've used in the past. I don't know if uh, if this is helpful or not, but if you've ever played guitar or played any sort of stringed instrument, um, think of an antenna sort of as like if you were to pluck a string on the guitar and it, you know, it, it radiates sound energy out. Okay, that's cool. Well, if you were to do that and then hold it up right next to another guitar, then just because of the frequency of the two strings are exactly the same, it would make that other guitar vibrate a little bit in a measurable way. And so that's sort of the principle of like um, radios have to be what they call resonant. Um, 
and just like a guitar, it, and, I, and I don't, I hope this is helpful. With guitars, they have or stringed instruments in general, like you can like put just sort of damp in the middle of it, and then they have that's what's called like a half harmonic, and so that's a way to make antennas shorter or give you a little bit more flexibility. Because if you were to do the half harmonic and you know pluck it next to another guitar, it would still make it you know the other guitar will vibrate a little bit, just not as much because then you're only radiating half the energy out. Um, similar type of principle. I hope that helps. So I guess it, the reason why I bring that up is because like, say you, you have a free, you want to be able to transmit on 446 megahertz. So what you can do is just find really any wire and measure it extremely precisely and make sure it's, it's the exact wavelength of 446 megahertz. And then you have an outstanding, beautiful antenna for that. But if you want to transmit on 446.50 megahertz, um, it might not work as good because that's the thing about going back to the guitar analogy. If you're plucking, plucking one string, well, then now you're plucking a different note. And so it's not going to work as good. And so that's what they call resonance. And so if you want to build an antenna for one specific frequency, it's extremely, um, extremely cheap and easy. But if you want to make it like more flexible, that's where it gets a little bit trickier. Um, the first antenna that I ever made was I, I made it out of, a, I went to Harbor Freight and bought a, a super cheap uh, tape measure and then cut it up to very specific frequencies. Um, and then uh, using hose clamps, like attached that to PVC piping. Um, and I haven't got a successful contact talking up and down, but I can hear the uh, orbiting satellites in the International Space Station with about $8 um, in, in equipment. Um, if you get it from Harbor Freight, because you're not looking for quality there. Um, but again, I was I can do that because I one uh, I, I'm not like some kind of genius. There's tons of articles out there about how to do it. So you just follow those instructions and be very precise. And then also in that case, the instructions for what the what the satellites transmit on is, are pretty much fixed, and so I don't have to worry about flexibility of different frequencies. Um, Yes, there are, and there are antennas. That, uh, essentially, um, there are antennas that are just they 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 make like a there's a way to graph how like what frequencies an antenna is sensitive on, and there's ways to make it so that you can, you know, it'll still work. Say in my previous example, it, it'll work on 446 megahertz, and it'll also work on 446.50, but just not as good. And then you can measure that in. Um, oh my goodness, I'm showing my noobness here. They call it SWR, which I believe is standing wave ratio, but essentially it just it measures and not only measures but also graphs the antenna's um, efficiency. Um, I have not thought about using cable vision to make an antenna for RF. I'm not sure what cable vision is. If you want to expound on that, um, I was thinking a coax line. Oh, oh, that was my thought. I might be wrong. Maybe, yeah. My um, my my satellites. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I, yeah, I have, I, um, I've seen people do it essentially, you know, coax is deliberately shielded so that the, the signal that goes through it doesn't escape. So you, you, what you're, what you're after is the copper that's inside of it. And those, those do make good antennas. There are lots of plans on them online for making the antenna out of it, but, um, sort of a, is a related thing. Um, the feed, the, the feed lines for my satellite antennas that I made, uh, was just regular coax. Um, you can make an antenna out of a lot of different things. It's funny. I've read like stories about, oh, the special forces are so cool. They have radios that nobody knows about where you can just make an antenna out of wire. And what they're talking about is special, you know, they are, they are fancy radios, but they're special forces and, and uh, radios that operate on HF. And so the, those guys, they, they know, oh, okay. Yeah. I can just find some, co some coax from the town that I'm stranded in, cut it up to just the right length and have, have an antenna. Um, Let's see. Getting kind of back, I, I, I don't want to go too long here because this is meant to be sort of a brief intro. But um, for like a lot of that, that the, the low end HF radio that I I meant, uh, I kind of I have a picture of there. That's not super common. Most people, if they want to get on HF, they're looking at you know a little bit more, or in this case, more than twice that. Uh, this one down here is a pretty very popular one. This is one I have at home actually, um, and you can find it on sale for like eleven hundred or something. Um, it's just, it's got more features. Like for example, this one has a, a tuner that can, it can take a, 
it can take the input from a fixed length antenna and then tune itself, not the antenna, to to be to electrically match whatever antenna I happen to have. That's going to be a pretty common feature, and that's one of the many things that you're paying for when you're looking at paying, you know, five hundred versus thirteen hundred. Um, they pack a whole bunch of features. Uh, like another example, I, I mentioned digital modes in the past until just somewhat recently. What you have to do is um, buy like a, a regular HF radio, then you buy with uh, an external sound card. They make special ones that are just for this purpose, but you you know, it's just a sound card. Um, they didn't always, they used to have to, have to like hack together computer sound cards um, and then hook it to your computer, hook that to your computer uh, and then have essentially your computer send out an audio signal to the sound card and then that goes into your radio. Um, now they have radios that have that built in, so you don't even need that. Those are the types of features you get when um, you got, um, yeah, hey, we'll see you squiddly. Um, when you when you get these fancier radios, and so like this one over here in the super expensive, um, this third one that's thirty three hundred, it has like multiple um, they call them VFOs, but essentially transceivers. So you can like listen on one, uh, listen and, and transmit on one frequency while listening and transmitting on another, um, or on frequency or band. They have split bands and stuff, and all kinds of crazy features. They all have like you know SD cards for logging and you know display port out so you can hook a tv directly to it it's, it gets pretty wild for the high-end stuff i don't i don't know anybody personally who has an, a radio that's that's that high end i do know a lot of people that are more like this guy here in, in the bottom right where just over time you accumulate you know oh i need this radio excuse me for this purpose or whatever um i look at it as sort of like people that are I not too long ago got into woodworking and I had this bad habit of buying tools just because I wanted to buy the tool. Like I bought a reciprocating saw. I had nothing to reciprocate saw. And then I realized like the, the key thing, what you do is you buy as cheaply as you can when you need that tool. And then over time um, you'll end up looking like this guy. I mean, he's probably spent his whole life as a ham. He's got special lighting and everything for his racks radio. I bet he didn't buy that all in one day. And so that's a, a cheaper route to have the same functionality as a super awesome, fancy, um, $3,300 radio. Um, I talked about all the different, like sort of the, the, the spectrum of how much or how little you can spend, but I didn't talk about the free option. And so if you, right now you can go to what they, uh, this website, websdr.org. I can put a link to it in chat just in case, but it's a pretty straightforward address. Watch me mistype it now. And what that is, and there's a bunch of other ones. That one just happens to be my favorite. But people all over the world will take uh, a small, um, not I almost said the word crappy. They're not crappy, but small receive only cheap SDRs, and then put them on the internet. And so you can just like click all where you know all, wherever you want on whichever band, and just tune in. And what you're hearing when you go to that site is is what's what can be observed in the RF, you know, spectrum at that location. I mean, it's real live in real time. I've seen there's um one of the there's one that's in like Northwestern Pennsylvania. And I've seen, I, I know guys in Maryland that they'll, if they're trying to test a new signal or if they want to try something out, they want to see if they're getting out or if the connection, everything's hooked up. They'll, you go to this website and then listen for them transmit and see if they hear themselves through the SDR, through the internet. Obviously there's a delay, but I mean, it's like, that's what's really happened there. And since SDRs are so flexible, like you can tune up to like, again, whatever you can tune up to on, a, um, if you were to have your own. So you can tune to like, um, radar signals and hear what radar radar sounds like or um they have these things called number stations it's a, an interesting it's not ham radio but it's uh an interesting aspect of history that you can listen to using these web S, these that that web page web sdr again there are other pages that do that have the same functionality i just happen to like that one and it's totally free and i've never done it myself but I've, I've heard that you can use a software called virtual audio cable to then take the output from that website and then pipe it into a radio like software to decode it and then actually you know if they're using digital modes actually read what they're what they're typing which is pretty neat i've always wanted to try that but um I, whatever i think i would imagine for at least some digital modes that that wouldn't be possible just the way some of them work but whatever it's something to try i have something new to learn um I think that's about it. I wanted to talk, I know it's probably aiming high, but I have uh, I want to talk about upcoming events. Hopefully someone is super fired up about ham radio and they want to get their license immediately tomorrow. That might be possible. I got an email that there's a, a ham exam in Laurel tomorrow in the, the Laurel Amateur, Amateur Radio Club. Um, and then it's the, the, the email is detailed in that. It said even after that, they're going to do what they call a fox hunt. Um, and so uh, 
that seemed like it's going on. But then I went to the, the page that their, their official website and their website says that no, because of COVID, they're still not doing any testing. So I got a little, little bit of conflicting information, but yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I wouldn't blame anybody for, you know, watching a, what is ham radio presentation and then going the next day to, uh, to, to get licensed, but it's an option if you want to, um, maybe I would call them before you go. Um, then not tomorrow, but then following Saturday, there definitely is a ham fest in Westminster and these ham fests are kind of cool. They can be, honestly, they can be kind of, um, I don't want to say off-putting, but a lot of times you'll go there and it's just nothing but old, like, like super, super old equipment. Old equipment can be great by the way, and super cheap. Um, oh, that's cool. That's good to know. Carroll County's testing tomorrow. I think, I wonder if that's the same club that runs that and they're just having a, uh, an exam at that. Cause I think it's the Carroll County ham club that runs that ham fest Westminster. They're, they're calling it like the, the Mason Dixie ham fest, the Mason Dixie lion ham fest or something. Um, and then uh, lastly, I, um, let me see, clickish technical hard for a beginner break into. Um, I would say, uh, Maybe a little bit if, if you talk to the wrong people and then no and no. So I've, I've seen that there, so I, earlier I showed repeaters and how repeaters work is when you first get your technical license, your tech, a technician license, um, tip, what, I know what I did in most ham, new hams in the central Maryland area, they find what they call it repeaters where you using your small, weak and not powerful radio, talk into a, a tower that's high up and has a lot more power. And then that broadcasts out over a much wider area because it's higher up and it has, it's just booming um, RF and, um, oh, okay, sorry. I won't, should I, should I stop uh, answering what I thought was your question? Uh, Molly? You're good. <laughs> okay, my bad. I was getting, about to go off on a rant and I'm already going long here, my bad. But anyway, the last thing that's coming up, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, the National Electronics Museum, uh, I believe it's around um, Linthicum or whatever. I I've, honestly I've not, haven't actually been, but I've heard a lot of people just sing praises for they, in the past. They would typically, uh, they would have in-person classes and it would be the, the, the date range there is long, but the idea is that you just once a week, you take, I think it's two or three hours. Um, and so they are upset with themselves for not doing that because of COVID understandably. So um, unfortunately I don't have a website for it. I'm just going to regurgitate what was, um, uh, let's see what I found. I got in my email um, because essentially you got to email a guy who who does that. But yeah, let's oh, okay. So it's um, three hours for a couple of several weeks. But then the idea is then you have like structured training and you don't have some um, ad hoc thing. And, and then if you if you do that, then you commit to it. And if you commit to something, you're more likely to follow through. Because I know, like, well, I got technician and I thought, oh, I should get general. That'd be fun to get on HF. And it took me like two years because I just kept kicking the can down the road. So that's why I think it's, you know, if, if you need that sort of like structure or motivation or commitment, um, signing up for something like that can be really quite handy because it's just, you know, it's a couple hours out of your whole week. And it spans a, a long time, so it's not like it's like cram and, and then data dump everything you learned. You're going to retain more of it, I think, if, if you take their approach. So that's coming up. I'm sure there's other stuff. That's just kind of what I found in my email just recently. Um, there are a ton of resources. So um, with that, if anybody has any questions, um, hit me with them. But hopefully, uh, you at least have a better idea of what ham radio is and why someone might be interested in it. And maybe you're interested in yourself. But uh, that's all I've got. I'll pause for several seconds in case people want to type. Hey, by the way, welcome, Ian. I will welcome home, and I'm, it's cool of you to come out. Good to see you, man. Or good to see your presence. Maybe you want to drop your uh, email or something in the. In the uh, oh, sure. Yeah. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to hit me up. Um, usually I'm on. Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, I'm blanking on their frequency at 146.885, which is the NASA Goddard uh, repeater. Usually I monitor that. Like I said, I'm not in the area, but. Um, 
yeah, or hit up anybody on, on Allocate Space. Like like Jelly alluded to earlier, like they're they're on all the things. So if if you're curious at all, someone from there can uh, can answer questions or provide other links or whatever ham needs you might have. Okay. Right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Back to you, Jelly. Yeah, no, thank you all for coming out. And thank you, Socks, for the presentation. We'll be putting this on YouTube shortly, so it'll be available on our YouTube channel. If you check out our website at allocatespace.org, there is a link at the top of the page and bottom of the page for our YouTube channel um, where we have just some nerdy stuff like how to solder, um, how to build a fire pit with, um, I won't talk about that, fun <laughs> things. Um, and well, thank you all for coming out. Uh, have a good night. We hope to, hope to see you throughout the STEM Fest and at more UAS events.